Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, November the 8th, 2019. It is currently 10.08 a.m. Central Time. Well, I hope that what I have for everyone today will prove to be extremely challenging, and I am hoping that it leads to some very interesting conversations. I hope that people will take what I have for them today and really think about it and then have conversations with people in their church, with people in their Sunday school class or their small group, or even have very important conversations with their pastor. But you better be prepared. If you take what I have for you today, if you take some of the questions that I'm going to ask, some of the things that I'm going to challenge, and you engage in conversations about this with other Christians, be prepared that the response may not be overly positive, all right? Because I'm going to challenge uh, some, well, let's just say a, a common way that Christians think. I'm going to challenge a, a common way in which Christians speak. I, I'm going to I'm going to kind of rock the boat a little bit. And it's and I'm not doing so just because I want to create controversy. I'm doing so because I believe in many cases Christians speak a certain way, but they never bother to think if what they are saying has any correlation with reality. I think in many cases pastors, churches, Christian authors, Christian radio, etc., etc., sells Christianity, right? Sells a Christianity that never lives up to what they claim it will do. It's like a really bad info commercial. You know, hey, my product will do A, B, C, D, and E, but wait, there's more. Call now. And I think sometimes we, we sell Christianity that, hey, come to Christ and look at all the things you get, but wait, there's even more. You also will throw in this, this, and this, and then people become a Christian, and then over a period of time, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't how it was sold to me. This is not what they promised. This is not what they claim. This, this is nothing like that. And I think that leads to some disillusionment, some frustration. And, and I've talked about this a number of times, and I think some Christians will acknowledge, oh, yeah, sometimes the way we talk about Christianity doesn't really fit the reality of Christianity. So I, I, I'm going to really challenge a very important idea. Now, this all started yesterday. News articles started going around about a Christian comedian. Uh, this Christian comedian has been uh, accused of sexual misconduct. He's been accused of sexual harassment. Now, I say, I say accused. I don't know all the facts. He's even acknowledged he's guilty of a number of things, definitely of sexual misconduct. Sounds like he's in, possibly been involved with affairs. He's he's done things with married women, um, according to some of the articles. Sounds like he's got, a, you know, definitely drunkenness was a part of it. Just a, a horrible scandal and a horrible situation. And I, and I gave a few thoughts about it. But the goal here is not to talk about that scandal. I'm not even going to give the name of the comedian. I'm not even going to go into all of that. What bothered me when I was reading um, all the reports were the comments posted under the reports because a number of Christians just jumped in and said, well, if he was walking in the spirit, he wouldn't have committed any of these sins. If he was walking in the spirit, he would not have fulfilled the lust of the flesh. So the whole reason he committed these acts is because he walk, wasn't walking in the Spirit. Now, if you stop five seconds and think about that, that raises some important questions, right? Are you claiming that if someone walks in the Spirit, they will 100% no longer fulfill the lust of the flesh? That would imply they will stop sinning. Now, if you say yes, then what you're claiming is that all Christians can stop sinning but for some reason, they're not. Or are you saying that if you walk in the Spirit, you won't commit those kinds of big public scandal kinds of sin, but all the other kinds of smaller, quote-unquote, venial sins, using Catholic terminology, you, you'll, you, you, those are okay. But if you walk in the Spirit, you won't commit the big ones. Is that, is that how we are to understand it? And, and when I listened, when I heard, you know, and, and saw the, the scripture, and just if you don't know what scripture that's referenced, that's Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, which reads, and I will read it from the King James, 
This I say then, walk in the spirit and you and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then Paul, writing to the church of Galatia, goes and lists all the works of the flesh. And he names some big ones, adultery, fornication. But wait a minute. Do we refer to adultery and fornication as only a physical act? Or do we say that a man can commit adultery by simply looking at a woman with lust? Are you telling me that if I walk in the spirit, I will never lust again? All right. Um, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murder. I mean, we and, and we would even have to ask if we go through that entire list. Is that a comprehensive list? Or is he just giving us some basic idea? If I walk in the spirit, will I just never sin again? Now, then, when I see Christians throw that out there, you, you know, someone looks at that and go, okay, so if I become a Christian, boom, then no problem. No, you know, not going to have a problem. It's all over. Not, you know, not going to struggle with this, not going to struggle with that. But most Christians will acknowledge, wait a minute, no one's going to be perfect. Well, if no one's going to be perfect, then how do we understand Galatians 5.16? Is Galatians 5.16 telling us it's possible? The problem is no one will ever do it? Well, then is it if no one will ever do it, then is it possible? How do we understand Galatians 5.16? How do we deal with these issues? And again, it comes down to Christians, you know, hopping on the internet. Here's this man who, who committed these sins. And now we're just going to say, hey, if he would have followed Galatians 5.16, he wouldn't have. And, and does that, the people who say that kind of thing, do they truly believe that they're walking in the spirit? Do they truly believe that they're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh in any way? How do we understand Galatians 5.16? These are some of the questions I raised yesterday, and I'm raising them again because this is what I'm going to do, all right? First, I'm going to give you some things to, to start thinking about, start working on, and then we're going to listen to a sermon. I just picked a random sermon from Galatians 5.16. I did a search, Galatians 5.16. First sermon popped up, grabbed the audio, and said, I'm going to play it because whether I agree with the sermon or disagree with the sermon is irrelevant. It's just going to show you how at least one pastor handles Galatians 5.16. And as you listen, you can ask yourself, wait a minute, is that biblical? Number two, um, if, if he, what he is saying is true, let me stop and take it to its logical conclusion and see if that works. And if we know it doesn't work, then we have to ask ourselves, well, maybe his interpretation of Galatians 5.16 was wrong. What is a better interpretation of Galatians 5.16, right? But here's what I want you to think about, all right? First, and I and I, some of these I'm going to repeat from yesterday's broadcast, but that's okay. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Now, we'll see if the sermon will answer that. Now, when I say, what does it mean? We need to, we need something tangible, something specific, not something vague, this is what walking in the Spirit is. Number two, how does one walk in the Spirit? Once we figure out what it is, it may answer how do we do it. But we, I mean, if we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I need to know exactly what that is, and I need to know exactly how to do that. And then three, what does it mean that if I walk in the Spirit, right? What, whatever walking in the Spirit is, however I do it, if I do it, right? What does it mean by telling me that if I do it, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Does that mean sinless perfection? What, what does that exactly mean? Does that mean I will sin some, but I will sin less? Exactly what does that mean? Now, you've got to answer those questions. We've got to figure out what walking in the Spirit is. How does one do it? And exactly what is the promise that comes with walking in the Spirit? Exactly what is this promise? Because if, if I can figure out what it is and how to do it, and, I, and you're telling me that the promise is that I will no longer fulfill the lust of the flesh, then I want to do everything I can today to figure out how to do so. So we're going to let other pastors give their best shot at defining what it is. And then you can listen to it and then go, well, that makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. All right, this is what it is. This is how I do it. If I do it, this is what I get. Now, why do I not get this? Because again, the, 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 this is kind of what basically when you look at the comments under that news article about the Christian comedian, this is basically what Christians are telling people. Hey, everyone, 
you won't commit any more sin, you know, if you walk in the Spirit. So everyone reading this, and it's like, can you imagine a, a brand new Christian going, oh, wow, I don't want to commit any sin like that. I'm going to walk in the Spirit, and I'll be good. But then you open up your Bible, and like, well, man, David was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't walking in the Spirit? Hmm, he committed all kinds of sin. Man, Solomon was the wisest person on the, you know, on the planet. Okay, well, he, he didn't go so good. Um, how about Paul, the Apostle Paul? For all, he, he says the things he wants to do, he doesn't do, and the things he doesn't want to do are the things he does. And so you start, you start reading the Bible, and you go, wait a minute. And Paul's the same one who wrote Galatians 5.16. <laughs> so how do you reconcile those two things? How do you reconcile that? Right, and and then it, even if you close the Bible and you just start looking at your daily life, you're like, man, I, I kind of live to the flesh for the flesh. I kind of, you know, what do I redefine what sin is so I don't feel like I'm sinning? What what do I do? So these are some important questions, and we need to build a a solid theology of what it means to walk in the Spirit, what it is, how to do it, and what you get by doing it. What do you get from doing it? So we're going to listen to a sermon. You can, and again, I may agree or disagree. It's irrelevant. The key is just we want to get the interpretation offered and then consider it and then see if it makes sense. So here it is. Listen carefully. Take very important notes. Email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Ask questions. Members of Victory Baptist Church, let's talk about it. And, uh, well, I hope this sparks a conversation wherever you are with the Christians around you. Because if that if this is the solution, then every person you know who sins, you just look at them and say, hey, walk in the Spirit and you'll stop sinning. I wish it, I mean, I wish it was that simple, but I, I question that. Should I question that? Some Christians say I'm not allowed to question that. I'm just c- considering the reality of what we see in church after church after church and the lives of Christians all around the world. You know what we see? Sin. You know what we see? Moral failure. You know what we see? They fall short of the glory of God. You know what we see? That they're desperate need of a Savior. You know what we see? They're desperate, desperately in need of the grace of God, mercy of God, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his shed blood because they don't live up to the, what God calls them to do. And they do fulfill the lust of the flesh on a regular and consistent basis. Now, is that wrong? Are you saying none of those people are saved or none of those people walk in the Spirit? And if no one ever walks in the Spirit, then are they saved? These are lots of important questions. All right, here's the sermon. Listen carefully. And, uh, well, we'll be talking about this again soon, trust me, because we need to work out exactly what this means. But we're going to let everyone else define it first and see maybe if someone out there has a good explanation. And if so, well, then maybe, well, that'll be the one we go by. But we're going to try to figure this out. But I want to take you along. I want to take you on the journey of figuring it out, not just trying to provide you an answer. All right. I think that's important. All right, here we go. Let's listen carefully. God bless. Well, I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. And tonight I want us to look at verses 16 through 18. For those of you who are visiting with us this evening, uh, we are going through a verse-by-verse study of the book of Galatians. It is powerful. It is prolific. It is really the most explosive epistle that... The Apostle Paul wrote, he wrote 13 that find their way in the New Testament canon of Scripture, but this by far is the most electrifying as far as tone and passion and unction with which he speaks. It is his uh, statement of uh, justification by faith, and we are in that section now that deals with sanctification and the living of the Christian life. All who have been justified by faith now must live by faith and pursue holiness. And these verses tonight that we will look at speak directly to our living the Christian life. The title of the message tonight is Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. I want to begin by reading these three verses that we will look at tonight. Beginning in verse 16. But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, 
and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If we are honest with ourselves, each one of us asks ourselves questions like this. How can I better live the Christian life? Why do I not grow more spiritually than what I do? What is holding me back? What is the problem? What is the struggle? Why do I feel so much conflict in me? Why do I so often fail the Lord? Why do I have such good intentions in the Lord, but not make more progress than I do spiritually? If you ask these questions of yourself at times in the quietness of the solitude of your thinking about the Lord, you're certainly not alone. I doubt that there's a one of us here tonight who does not ask him or herself uh, these questions and regularly. And certainly, we need answers to these questions. We need good answers. We need biblical answers. This is why these verses in Galatians 5 are so important for our Christian life and why they deserve our focus and study tonight as well as the implementation of these verses in our lives. Here is how to live the Christian life. Here is how to grow spiritually. Here is why we suffer setbacks. Here is why we feel conflict within us. Here is an accurate diagnosis of what is holding us back from greater growth. The key is found in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who is the agent of our sanctification. That is to say, it is His assigned responsibility to bring about our spiritual growth and development. It is the Holy Spirit who is at work within us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. It is the Holy Spirit who is equipping us and who is enabling us and encouraging us to live the Christian life in a way that is pleasing to God. In other words, all of this is not laid at our feet without the help that we need, and it is in the Holy Spirit of God. There are at least 14 references to the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is only six chapters, yet there are 14 direct, specific references to the Holy Spirit, and they are all found in the last four chapters that speak on justification and sanctification. And this should be an indication to each one of us tonight of the primary importance of the Holy Spirit in the growth of the believer. In Galatians 3, verse 5, Paul writes that we have been provided with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, verse 2, he says we have received the Spirit. Galatians 3, 3, he says we have begun by the Spirit and we are being perfected by the Spirit, meaning being brought to maturity by the work of the Spirit within us. In Galatians 4, 6, Paul writes that God has sent forth His Spirit into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Meaning, it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit within our hearts to make God real. And for there to be intimacy in our fellowship and a true knowledge of God, that is the work of the Holy Spirit within us, drawing us closer to the heart of God. In Galatians 4.29, Paul says that we have been born again by the Spirit. And in chapter 5, verse 5, he says we have hope through the Spirit. Chapter 5.16, we walk by the Spirit. Chapter 5.18 says we are led by the Spirit. Chapter 5.22 says we bear the fruit of the Spirit. Chapter 5, 25 says, we live by the Spirit, we walk by the Spirit. And chapter 6, verse 8 says, that the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit. 
Here is virtually an entire theology of the Holy Spirit. Here is a pneumatology, a teaching of the Holy Spirit self-contained in this one book. And when we pull all of these verses together, we are reminded of the primary and central importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and the sufficiency of the Spirit to carry out our Christian life. Beloved, this is how we are to live the Christian life. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three are involved in our salvation. God the Father has purposed and predestined our salvation. God the Son has purchased and procured our salvation. And God the Spirit has planted and personalized our salvation. And so tonight, I want us to look at these verses, think about what Paul is saying to us, as well as how they relate to our own spiritual lives. As we look at these verses, there are four main headings that I want you to note with me as we walk verse by verse and literally phrase by phrase through this section. And I want you to note first the command. That's how verse 16 begins. It begins with the command, here is the action point. Here is what God is calling upon the Galatians to do. Verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit. When Paul says, but I say, he is setting his words in contrast to what the Judaizers were telling the Galatians. They had been bringing false teaching to the Galatians regarding how to be right with God and how to live the Christian life. And so Paul, so as to put a wedge between himself and the false teachers, begins verse 16 by emphatically saying, but I say to you to draw their attention back to his apostolic teaching and for them to turn away from the false teaching that they were receiving. Now, here's what he says. Walk by the Spirit. The Christian life is a supernatural life. And it can only be lived by the supernatural power that comes to us by the Holy Spirit. The Christian life cannot be lived on a natural level. It must be lived on a supernatural level. And there is only one who can enable us to do so, and it is God the Holy Spirit. We know that the Spirit lives within every believer. Let me remind you of two signature texts that remind us that every Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The first is Romans 8 and verse 9. Paul writes, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. That is to say that those who belong to Christ have the Holy Spirit within them and we are in the Holy Spirit. Then in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, we want to note this verse again. Paul writing to the Corinthians said, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God. Listen, if there were ever any Christians on the face of this earth who would not have had the Holy Spirit, we would have said it was the church at Corinth. And yet Paul addresses them and says, even the believers in Corinth, those carnal believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every true Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we are to walk by the power of that He provides. That is to say, we are to walk moment by moment in total submission to and in complete dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit as we live our Christian lives. At any given point in time, at any given point in time, we are either walking by the Spirit or by the flesh. There is no third middle ground. And He enjoins us 
to walk by the Spirit. We cannot walk in a manner that is pleasing to God if we walk in the abilities of our own flesh. We are all spiritual uh, paraplegics. And we cannot walk to live the Christian life in our own strength. We cannot. But the indwelling Spirit of God within us can enable us to do so. Do you see the word walk in verse 16? Walk by the Spirit. That is a metaphorical word that is to paint a picture in our mind of what the Christian life looks like. And in this case, we are intended to see that the Christian life is represented as a walk. There is a beginning point. That is when we were born again and we entered the Christian life. There is an ending point. That is when we will leave this world and enter into the presence of God. And everything in between is a part of our Christian walk. Why does Paul represent the Christian life as a walk? Well, walking requires effort on our part. Putting one foot in front of the other. And so does the Christian life. The Christian life is not lived in a passive way. It is not let go and let God. No, we are called to be active and to put our feet into the narrow path and to pursue holiness. Also, walking requires making progress and moving forward and advancing toward a destination, not remaining where we once were, but advancing toward the goal. So it is in the Christian life. We are to be moving forward in Christ's likeness. Also, walking implies that I have not yet arrived, doesn't it? We don't sit down until we arrive at the destination. And as long as we are walking, that implies we have not yet arrived And so it is in the Christian life. Every single one of us here tonight still have much, much ground yet to walk as we pursue Christ's likeness. Also, walking involves slow and steady progress. Pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Christian life is not, I repeat, it is not a series of short sprints where we sprint for 50 yards and then just sit down and recapture our our breath and wait a couple weeks and then get up and run another 50-yard sprint. No, the Christian life is a continual, ongoing walking in the Lord, steadfast, with much endurance, always pressing on. Also, walking involves a ground zero kind of experience. In other words, our feet are to be on the ground. There is a certain earthy reality about the Christian life. We're not sitting in an ivory tower. We're not disconnected from the reality of life. We're not sitting on a cloud plucking a heart. No, our feet are on the ground, this earth. And we are walking through all of the affairs of this life. We are living at ground zero. Walking necessitates choosing the right path as well. And keeping our eyes on the destination. And heading in the right direction. And all of this is implied in this metaphor, walk. All of this is involved in the Christian life. We are to walk, please note, by the Spirit. By the agency of the Spirit. This command is primary. And let me tell you why. Because we cannot fulfill any other command until we fulfill this command. All of the other commandments are fulfilling them. Hinges upon our obedience to this command. I cannot love others without first walking by the Spirit. I cannot have joy without first walking by the Spirit. I cannot know peace without first walking by the Spirit. I cannot know or do anything that is incumbent upon me in the Christian life 
in my own flesh. Can we agree upon that tonight? And how desperately we need to be walking by the Spirit and have the Spirit's power in order to fulfill everything else that God requires of us in the Christian life. In fact, in verse 22 and 23, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, how much we want all of these virtues, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But the reality of all of these in my Christian life and in yours hinges upon this commandment in verse 16 to walk by the Spirit. It is that fundamental. It is that foundational. It is that necessary in my Christian life. If we bypass this commandment, we are walking in the flesh. We are preaching in the flesh. We are singing in the flesh. We are praying in the flesh. We are serving in the flesh. We are parenting in the flesh. We are doing everything in our Christian life in the rank carnality of our flesh. This commandment is absolutely non-negotiable. If we are to please God and for His favor to be upon our lives, I cannot even take one step forward in the Christian life. I cannot even take one baby step to inch my way forward except I walk by the Spirit. Now before we move on, I want to draw your attention yet again to this word walk. I want you to see it. But I say walk by the Spirit. I want to tell you four things yet more about this word walk. Number one, it is in the imperative mood. It is a verb that is in the imperative mood. And what this means is it is a command. If I am not walking by the Spirit, then I am living in open disobedience to God who commands me to walk by the Spirit. This is not a suggestion This is not an option. This is an apostolic command that has come from the commander-in-chief, commander-in-chief of heaven and earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, it is in the imperative mood. It is a command. Second, it is in the present tense, which is to say it is to be my continuous, regular action. This is to be a lifestyle. That's what the present tense here indicates. I am to be always walking by the Spirit. There is never to be a moment in my Christian life when I am not walking by the Spirit. I am to walk by the Spirit when I wake up. I am to walk by the Spirit throughout the day. And wherever I go and whatever I do, I am to be walking by the Spirit. I am to work by the Spirit. I am to play by the Spirit. I am to parent by the Spirit, minister by the Spirit, pray by the Spirit. Everything throughout the day is to be done by the Spirit in the energy and in the enablement and in the empowering of God within the believer. There's a third observation that I want you to note, and it is this is in the active voice which means that this is something I must actively do. I must move out. And I am responsible before God to take decisive steps of walking by the Spirit. This is not in the passive. We are not to sit back and wait for God to come and to massage our calves and to shuffle a foot forward on our behalf. No, it is incumbent upon us It is our responsibility to take ownership for this and to be active, and we can only do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, it is my responsibility and it is 
yours. And then fourth, it is in the second person plural. Which is to say, this is directed to the entire church. This is directed to all of us. Not just to some of us, but to all of us. Not just to those who are in full-time ministry. Not just to those who serve as elders or deacons. Not just to those who have a visible place in the life of the church. But to each and every one of us, we are to walk by the Spirit. This is the command, and this is what the Lord commands of each one of us tonight and every moment of every day, walk by the Spirit. Now second, I want you to notice the consequence. Please note at the end of verse 16, the consequence of doing so. And you will not. And A.T. Robertson, in his word studies, tells us that not is emphatic, meaning it should leap off the page as we read this. It is to be underscored as it was in Paul's emphasis. And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. This tells us that the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than the power of the flesh. If we will walk by the Spirit, we will not, we will not, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. None of us can cave in to the excuses that are often put forward. Well, the devil made me do it. Or the the temptation was so great. Yes, those are true. But greater is He who is in you than he who is in the Holy Spirit. We have the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit that we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh refers to what remains of the old man after a person is saved. It refers to our unredeemed humanness. That part of a believer that awaits future redemption at the time of glorification. Until then, the believer has a redeemed self living in an unredeemed humanness. It is the sinful human nature which includes the mind and the soul. But he says that if we will walk by the Spirit, the Spirit will enable us to mortify the deeds of the flesh. And we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, what are these desires of the flesh? Well, in verse 19 through 21, he gives us some indication of the desires of the flesh. And there's not a one of these that a Christian is not capable of uh, committing. Now look at verse 19. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, asked David. Impurity, asked Solomon. Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Ask the church at Corinth about these things. Disputes, dissensions, Factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you. These are the deeds of the flesh and they are the fruit of the desires of the flesh. And while these deeds of the flesh will not be characteristic of a lifestyle of a believer... Nevertheless, we are capable of committing these individual acts and we retain the flesh. That is why we must walk very circumspectly. That is why we so desperately need to walk by the Spirit. So, this is what Paul is saying. Now, legalism, of which we have spoken much of in this series, tries to suppress the desires of the flesh 
and the deeds of the flesh by drafting external legislation. It tries to quench the desires of the flesh and to fence in the deeds of the flesh by erecting man-made rules and regulations for living the Christian life. I think you can see this. Legalism tries to live the Christian life, listen to this, by the power of the flesh in order to repress the flesh. What an odd theology that is. It tries to restrain the flesh by the flesh. That is what legalism is all about. Legalism tries to put a person in a straitjacket and tell them, do not, do not, do not. Do not even think about it. But the problem is the flesh is very real and the flesh is very deep and outward rules and outward regulation can never impair the flesh. There is only one who can mortify the flesh. There is only one who can resist temptation in the truest sense. And that is the mighty Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. We have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit as we live our Christian lives. I want you to note third, the conflict. Verse 17, Paul just lays it out. He lays out the conflict that we all experience. And before I read verse 17, let me just say this. Everything that has been said to this point is not to su- suggest that the Christian life is just automatic cruise control all the way to glory. And that there is no resistance and there is no conflict. No, quite the opposite. There is this inward spiritual struggle within each and every one of us. In fact, before we were saved, it was just the flesh and we were walking according to the course of this world and there really wasn't even as much of a struggle as we now experience because now we are a new man in Christ and we have the Holy Spirit of God and as we will read in verse 18, He is always leading us to holiness. He is always leading us away from sin. And therein is the struggle that we face. Look at verse 17. Paul writes, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. You talk about a tug-of-war. You talk about conflict going on on the inside. And this is the reality of the Christian life. Again, the flesh is that part of a believer that stands in complete opposition against the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And I want you to know this this conflict, the flesh against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, we never outgrow it. We never reach a level of spiritual maturity where we can say, well, that's all behind me. There's no longer any struggle now in my Christian life. I've crested the top of the mountain. It's all downhill the rest of the way. Quite the contrary. The flesh remains very alive within us and will do so until the moment of our glorification. That's what's going to make heaven so great. We can finally pull the ripcord and we will be cut off from this old sinful flesh and pure motives and pure loves will finally run its fullest course and we will love God as we truly want to love God and it will be a one-way street and all of our affections and all of our desires will be channeled to the glory of God. Heaven will be so wonderful. But until then, we find ourselves in this conflict The opposition is constant. And I want you to know there is zero compatibility between the flesh and the Spirit. There is no compatibility whatsoever. They are at enmity with each other inside of us. It is real and it is head-on conflict within us. But victory is possible, praise God by the power, the omnipotent, sovereign power 
of the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. He goes on to say in verse 17, For these are in opposition to one another. They, there is never a ceasefire. There is never a truce. There is never a moment when the guns are laid down. There is never an end to this fight. Constantly, continually, these are in opposition to one another. So that you may not do the things that you please. Paul is not saying here that there is no victory over the desires of the flesh. Quite the contrary. The whole purpose of this is saying that if you will walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Rather, what Paul is stating here is that we cannot win this victory against the flesh and against sin in our own strength, in our own willpower, in our own dedication. This is not like going on a diet where we just bite a bullet and let's do it. This is accomplished and realized only in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And this ongoing conflict throughout the entirety of our Christian lives underscores the necessity of every moment of every day that we walk by the Spirit. We cannot let our guard down for one moment. If you would please turn to Romans chapter 7. You know we could not look at these verses without referencing Romans chapter 7 beginning in verse 15 in which Paul gives us an even fuller expression of this internal conflict within a believer. As I prepare to read these verses, I want to say that I believe that this is referring to a believer. There is some debate, just so that you'll be up to square on this, as to whether Romans 7 is addressing an unbeliever or a believer, this kind of conflict. And I believe that it is referring to a believer, and I want to quickly give you three reasons why. Number one, context. And this is found in the middle of the section on sanctification. If this was dealing with an unbeliever, we would find it back at the beginning of chapter 3 or at the end of chapter 1, back when Paul is discussing total depravity and radical corruption. But no, he is discussing this in the midst of a section on sanctification, Romans 5 through 8. It's right square in the middle. And context is one of the great interpreters of Scripture. No, this is dealing with a Christian and his sanctification. A second reason is the verb tenses that are used here in these verses. They are in the present tense. It is a present reality that Paul is describing. If he had used the past tense, then we might question, well, maybe he was talking about his old life before the Damascus Road. But it is in the present tense, and it underscores this is his present strength struggle right now as an apostle. And then third, this is intensely personal. It is in reality Paul's own experience. And he is giving his own testimony, if you will, of the nature of the conflict in his own Christian life. Now let me say this. If Paul has a struggle with his Christian life, I can see many of you smiling right now, then then all of us are going to have this struggle in our Christian life. So beginning in verse 15, Paul says, For what I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. In other words, he's saying, I want to be on fire for God. I want to walk the narrow path. I want to, to move forward in personal holiness. That is the desire in my new man. But there is still the practice in my rea real existence that I hate. Now, we can commend Paul and we should endorse and adopt for ourselves that we too should hate sin in our lives. Verse 16, But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. 
So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, what Paul is saying here, he's not schizophrenic and saying, well, it's not me, it's, it's uh, someone else. What he is saying is, it's not the new man that I am in Christ Jesus. That's not where the problem is. It's not what the Holy Spirit has created in me of a new nature and a new mind. That's not where the problem is. Sin is not going to, uh, will not arise out of my new nature. No, it is sin which dwells in me and it is in His flesh. Verse 18, but I know that nothing good dwells in me and he's referring to his flesh. That is in my flesh. There it is, he says it. For the willing is present, that's in his new man, but the doing of the good is not. You talk about frustrating. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me. Wow. The one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war. There is that conflict. There is that struggle. This is what we can relate to. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free? Thanks be to God. The victory is through the Lord Jesus Christ. This conflict will beset us from now until the time we step into glory. And how this underscores the absolute necessity every moment of every day that I must walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. You and I would do well to incorporate more into our own prayer life Asking God to help me walk by the Spirit. How we must be consciously dependent upon our need for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. Finally, in verse 18, the conquest. Paul now concludes these verses on a note of triumph regarding the Spirit's work within us. And Paul says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit. Now stop right there. That is another way of saying if you are saved. It's not that some Christians are being led by the Spirit and other Christians are not being led by the Spirit. All Christians are indwelt by the Spirit and all Christians are being led by the Spirit. It's just some Christians aren't doing a good enough job of following But the Lord is always leading. And He is leading us into purity and leading us into holiness and leading us into godliness and leading us into Christ-likeness and leading us away from sin and out of darkness. So if you are led by the Spirit, it says you are not under the law. It is the flesh that would try to keep the law. And Paul says no. That is not the reality of your life. You are now being led by the Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? William Hendrickson is one of the great commentators of the last century. And in his commentary on the book of Galatians, he writes this, having asked the question, what is it to be led by the Spirit? Hendrickson writes, quote, It is that constant effective and benevolent influence which the Holy Spirit exercises within the hearts of God's children, whereby they are being directed and enabled, directed and enabled more and more 
to crush the power of indwelling sin and to walk in the way of God's commandments freely and cheerfully. Not because they have to, but because they want to. Unquote. Thus, to be led by the Spirit means far more than merely seeking daily guidance and decision making. Such as, where do I live? Who do I marry? Where do I work? That's not what this is talking about, being led by the Spirit. This refers to being led by the Spirit into personal godliness and into holiness and it includes the controlling power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to move forward in growth in godliness. This means the Spirit is leading us, as I have already said, into personal purity and into Christ's likeness, and it will lead us away from the practice of sin. This word, led, if you are led by the Spirit, it underscores our personal responsibility in this. The Spirit is leading, but we have the responsibility to follow and to obey. And it is incumbent upon us to move out and to move forward as He leads us into the pursuit of holiness. This speaks to our accountability before God for our own sanctification. It speaks to our responsibility before God to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. It speaks to our activity and our energy in following the Spirit's direction into godliness. One of the greatest theologians to ever really live, period, but of America in the 19th century, the great Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. One of the great theologians of Princeton in the 19th century wrote at this point concerning this, quote, It is the Holy Spirit's part to keep us in the path and to bring us at length to the goal. But it is we who tread every step of the way our limbs that grow weary with the labor, our hearts that faint, our courage that fails, our faith that revives, our sinking strength, our hope that instills new courage into our souls as we toil over the steep ascent. Unquote. No, it is God's work within us, but it is our responsibility to follow in the Christian life where the Holy Spirit of God leads. And that is why we do not need a list of legalistic rules for regulations on the Christian life that are nowhere found in the Word of God. We have the mighty Holy Spirit within us who is always leading us into the very center of of the narrow path. The real question on the table is, are we sensitive to His leadership and are we following where the Spirit is leading into godliness? This is precisely what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. If I could just read these verses, Romans 8, 12 through 14. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh? For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. What he is saying is, the wages of sin is death, and if you are habitually living according to the flesh, it's an indication you are in a state of spiritual death. But, verse 13, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In this context, this verse is not talking about decision-making in the Christian life. Who to marry? Where do I work? Which house do I buy? It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with sanctification. 
And it is saying that the flesh is leading us in one direction and the Holy Spirit is leading us in a total another direction. And it is our responsibility to resist the flesh and to mortify the flesh and not cave in and to take steps of obedience and walk by the Spirit and follow the Spirit's leadership in our lives. This is what Paul teaches the Galatians regarding living the Christian life. And beloved, as we consider how it is that we live the Christian life, let us remember that God has put His Spirit within us. His primary ministry as He glorifies God in our lives is to lead us into holiness and into purity of character and conversation and conduct and thoughts and all the rest. And He does an outstanding job of conforming us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, let us all humble ourselves before the living God. Let us all recognize our own weakness, our own humanness, our own limitations. Let us call upon God to fill us with the Spirit. Let us be careful not to quench the Spirit, not to grieve the Spirit, but to obey the Spirit and to follow the Spirit. And as we do, we will be advancing in the things of God and being conformed into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. How much better it is to have an inward work of transformation by the Spirit of God than to have the outward legislation of legalism that simply posts its rules, do not, do not, do not, do this, do this, do this, and have not the power to even to begin to fulfill them. How much better it is to have God in our hearts and in our lives in a very real and powerful way leading us into maturity and into Christ-likeness. After I pray, we will be having an ordination service and our elder, new elder and deacons will be coming forward. And as these men do, they will be stepping into a position of spiritual leadership. Did you hear that? A position of spiritual leadership. There is only one way that spiritual leadership can be carried out. And that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. How desperately these men will no doubt sense and feel their need now more than ever to walk by the Spirit as the weight of responsibility is placed upon them. We thank God for each of these men as we already see clear and obvious evidences that they are walking by the Spirit These are Spirit-filled men. These are Spirit-empowered men. These are men in which we see the supernatural power and reality of God the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. And as they step into these two offices in this local church, it will only be by the power of the Holy Spirit as they walk every moment of every day into the fullness of what God has prepared for them. Men, may the Lord fill you, anoint you, empower you with the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your lives. And may you know a fuller power that can come only from God as you step forward to do God's work, God's way, for God's glory and the power of of God's Spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank You that You have equipped us with the Holy Spirit, that You have put this deposit within us, and You have literally moved into our lives. You live in us in a very real way in which you did not previously do so before we were saved. 
But now as born-again believers, you have entered into our lives at the very deepest part of our soul. And you are now at work within us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. And we are confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in us shall perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Lord, may all of us here tonight, every one of us who are believers in Christ, may we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives as He convicts us of sin and leads us to repentance and points us to paths of holiness. And for these men who will step forward in just a moment, we pray for them. They will know the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of the fullness of the power of the Spirit of God in their lives. As they humble themselves and as they submit and surrender to the Lordship of Christ, as they choose to walk in obedience, Lord, we pray that all of this would translate into that they are walking by the Spirit. Make us a Spirit-filled church. Give us Spirit-filled leaders. Give us Spirit-filled men at the helm that this church would truly be a Spirit-filled body of believers. We pray this in the name of Him who sent the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we come now to the time that we want to lay hands on these men, and I want to now ask if our elder and these new deacons, if they would come and if they would uh, come to the front of the communion table, if you would come right now. And elders of our church, would you come and gather around them? And Tom Gibson, who's the chairman of our elders, will now... Uh, read their names, and give a brief charge. I think the blessing uh, of any church is the giving of spirit-filled men, and we definitely at Cottage Hill, uh, <laughs> Christ Fellowship Baptist Church, wow, have been truly, truly blessed by having such a multitude of men. And these men, each of them, uh, they have been examined, and not only them themselves, but their, their family, which is a representation of their own ministry, have been examined. Their walk manifests the profession that Christ is the Lord of their life. And this calling truly is on their family also. So even as we pray, we will pray that God would not only direct their path and keep their eyes clear, because... Satan hates godly men. But we will also pray that he would lead your families, that there would be a protection around your heart and their hearts as you represent him. So we have these men tonight, Richard Grogan, Frank Hamilton, Michael Keller, Jason Quaid. Each of these men are coming tonight as they, their names have been put forth as deacons, and they have been examined. And they're coming tonight to say amen to that call in their life. And Richard Atwell, he's coming tonight to be ordained as an elder, and we welcome him on the elder team of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. And we thank you for your dedication already. And this is just a a title that's been put upon you as you've given in to that calling upon your life. So as we pray over you men, would you kneel here and Dr. Lawson's going to pray and we're going to pray over you also. Amen. Men kneel, elders gather around, lay hands on them. We read in the book of Acts how the leaders of the church laid hands upon the other new leaders. It signifies our identification with them that we stand with them and we are one with them. We recognize that God has set them apart for this task. And so we now ordain them and commission them into this ministry. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank You for Your blessing upon our church. Your name is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And among the provisions that You have made for this local church, You have provided us godly men who are faithful, reliable, trustworthy, spiritual men who walk by the Spirit. And for these men who now step into the office of deacon, these four men, for Richard, for Frank, for Mike, for Jason, we pray that You will use them as servants of blessing in our midst, that You will use them to meet needs, real needs in the life of this church. We pray that our body would function as You would desire it to, as these men assume the tasks and the responsibilities of a servant in this church in this official capacity. Fill them with the power of Your Spirit that they may carry this out in the energy of Your Spirit. And for Richard Atwell, who now steps forward, and we believe one who is called forward by You to serve now as a shepherd, as an elder, an overseer, in the life of this church. We recognize that He meets the requirements of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And He has been serving as a minister of the Word of God in our midst, teaching Sunday school and leading a home fellowship group and being actively involved in the lives of so many people through His counseling ministry. Lord, we recognize Your fingerprints upon Him And so we receive Him as Your gift to this body. And we ask that You graft Him now into the fabric of our elder team. And may we serve and lead as one and that Richard would be mightily used in our midst and that Your ministry through him would be very effectual. May this congregation be well served by these men. Father, we commit all five of them into Your sovereign hands and we believe that that's where their lives already are. And we recognize that You hold them in the very palm of Your hand. We ask that You would protect them. We ask that You would place them in this body where You would desire them to serve. And may may the blessings upon this flock, be very obvious. So, Father, we now commit them to this office, to deacon and to elder. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.